warriors, athletes, artists and colonialists, sailors and pirates, traders and philosophers, the ancient Greeks never ceased to make creative trouble for themselves and in their talent for creation and destruction we recognize ourselves. The rise of Greek civilization, this time on the Western tradition. The Western tradition really begins with the Greeks. Our kind of institutions, our kind of thinking, even our kind of sinning are all connected with the rationalism of the Greek mind. The Greeks did not take the world on trust, they did not attribute it to the will of God, they did not abandon themselves to fate, instead they asked questions and came up with answers. The Greek philosopher Plato once wrote that philosophy is the child of wonder. It was the gift of the Greeks that they inquired into the things that excited their wonder and their insatiable curiosity paid off in instability, in insecurity, but also in greatness. Let's begin with a Greece of 3,200 years ago, around 1200 BC, when a series of invasions and wars shook the ancient world from Anatolia to Egypt. This is a scene from the Odyssey. Most of what we know about the 400 years between 1200 and 800 BC comes from the Odyssey and from another epic poem, the Iliad, both attributed to the Greek poet Homer. The first poem, the Iliad, tells how the Greeks besieged and destroyed Troy, an Asian city near the Hellespont. The second poem, the Odyssey, depicted in this Roman wall painting, tells what happened after the Trojan War to Odysseus, the king of Ithaca and a leader of the Greeks. It's likely that the world both poems describe was similar to the actual period between 1200 and 800 before Christ, a sort of dark ages. Dark because we know so little about them, but also because life was even more brutish and short than usual. We see a society of warriors and petty chiefs greedy for honor and riches, ruthless, highly competitive, but with a code of behavior which provides an enduring formula for distinction in later times, that of heroism, nobility, eventually chivalry. By the 8th century BC, the heroic quest for glory had been ritualized by the Greeks in great competitive games. We know this best from the games established at Olympia in 776 before Christ. The Greek name for the games was Argon, the word for contest or competition from which our word agony derives. The honor you strove for was so high that neither agony nor even life were too high a price to pay for winning. On the other hand, the Greek athletes were realistic as well as materialistic. Athletes faced the agony of competition because they wanted to win prizes. A winner might well be fed, clothed, possibly housed at his city's expense for the rest of his life, and he would pay no taxes. Later, through the centuries, the Greek athlete's very sensible way of looking at competition was going to be sterilized by people who thought that material concerns were base. 
Noble sacrifice was what they wanted to see, not worldly ambition. And so the image of the athlete agonistes, the athlete suffering in his quest, this became an important part of the Greco-Roman culture. It was taken up by the early Christians, who were a part of that culture, of course, and who were engaged in a terrible wrestling match with the devil and with evil. And then it was going to be revived by the Protestants in the 16th century and the Victorians in the 19th century. And it's still with us today, as you can see in the disapproval of modern fans when they discover that their heroes are business people as much as they are athletes. The heroic values that the Iliad and the Odyssey expressed have come down to our own day nearly 3,000 years later. But that doesn't mean the Homeric hero is anything like the medieval knight, say, who blunders into battle for honor's sake. The Homeric hero may be noble, but he is also shrewd. Odysseus, whom you see here as he blinds the monster Cyclops, Odysseus is not just a good sailor and a fine athlete, he's also quick-witted and crafty, a master of deceit and artful tales, as the Greek goddess Athena tells him more in praise than blame. Athena compares Odysseus to herself, saying, you are far the best of all mortals in counsel and speech, and I am celebrated among all gods in craft and cunning. Which tells you something not only about Greek heroes, but also about Greek religion. Their gods like Pluto and Persephone here may have been supernatural and superhuman, but they were otherwise like men and women with human physiology and human passions. This humanization of the gods was something new, a revolution in religion. Gods were to be honored as men were, with palaces like this one in Sicily, where they could live and keep the offerings they got and be worshipped. But only gods would be worshipped, not pharaohs, not kings. For unlike Persians, the Greeks worship no man as master, only the gods. So now, for the first time, man is the measure of all things, as the Greek philosopher Protagoras said in the 5th century before Christ. This was an extraordinary assertion to make in a world where normal men and women still seemed very puny and probably felt very puny in an immensely vast, immensely mysterious universe of which they knew almost nothing. And yet in the same era we come upon an Athenian statesman, Pericles, extolling not just men, but free men, and the advantages of individual liberty. We live as free citizens, says Pericles, not only in our public life, but in our attitude to one another in the affairs of daily life. We are not angry at our neighbor if he behaves as he pleases. We do not cast sour looks at him, which, if they do no harm, cause pain. The ruins of Athens remain monuments to Pericles' vision of his city as a center for art, literature, and wonderful architecture. 
But Athens was only one of hundreds of Greek city-states in the 5th century before Christ, each of which was called a polis, meaning both city and state, but also commonwealth, a body of citizens in an autonomous fatherland. These polis spread from the Black Sea to the Western Mediterranean. The heaviest concentration was on the Greek mainland, on the islands, and in Ionia on the western coast of Asia Minor, where the richest and most advanced cities had grown in the 7th and 6th centuries BC, because they were closest to the trade and the culture of the Middle East. The scale of Polis was small, partly because of geography. Greece, Ionia and the islands are checkerboards of mountains, valleys and small plains, which tends to make for isolated settlements that have easier access to the surrounding sea than to one another. So the sea became the Greek highway par excellence. It was on the sea that Greeks sailed, traded, raided, pirated. But Polis, like Selinus, the ruins of which we see here, were also small because the Greeks thought they should be small. Plato thought the ideal city should have 5,000 citizens, which really meant a population of 20,000 or so, not counting a few resident aliens. Women, foreigners and slaves, of course, had no civic rights in ancient Greece, but then that was true of most of the world until the 19th century. As it turned out, some polis were very tiny, and only three in the 5th century BC had more than 20,000 citizens, that is about 100,000, Athens foremost among them. But whatever its size, each Greek polis had its own personality, laws, patriotism, and at the same time, each shared in the common pride of being Hellenes, part of the world of Hellas, which is not a nation or a race, but a cultural community and a very powerful concept. The Homeric myth attributes the community of Hellas to a common ancestor, a hero called Helen or Helenus, and then to common action in the Trojan War. Historically, however, this sense of community was probably precipitated by the extraordinary experience of the Persian Wars. Between the middle of the 6th century BC and the beginning of the 5th, the Greeks provoked and then withstood the immense might of the Persian Empire. They defeated the Persians not once, but several times, most notably at Marathon in 490 BC, at Salamis in 480, and finally at Plataea in the following year. Marathon and Plataea were great victories for what the Greeks called hoplites, disciplined, heavy-armed infantry fighting in close formation. These hoplites would become the basis of Greek military success for the next 200 years. But Marathon and Plataea were also great victories for the notion of community. The squabbling Greek polis had to bury their differences and join together against the foreign barbarians who didn't speak Greek, but something that sounded like ba ba ba. As Themistocles, the Athenian commander, said after the Greeks had ripped the Persian fleet to shreds at Salamis, 
It is not we who have done this, meaning not we Athenians, but all Greeks together, all Hellas. And out of these victories, an awareness would grow of Greece and of a common Greek spirit which hadn't existed before. It was a critically important impulse to Greek confidence, indeed, to Greek civilization. We can talk about a Greek civilization because despite geographical dispersion, political fragmentation, endless bloody conflicts, the Hellenes shared a strong cultural unity in language, in common myths, in similar customs, you might say in a common cultural personality. No matter what polis they lived in, they were quick to adopt skills and practices they found useful and then improve them and make them their own. They took the Phoenician alphabet they added vowel sounds and they turned it into Greek. They didn't invent pottery, but they individualized it. By the 6th century BC, potters and other artists were signing their work, a revolutionary step that proclaimed the artist as an individual. They copied a freestanding statue from Egypt, but they liberated and they humanized its form and they painted it, which made it more lively. And they also invented the nude as an art form, one more assertion of human confidence. By the 5th century BC, the Greek cultural personality had affirmed itself in a very grand enterprise indeed, the Acropolis, the hilltop citadel of Athens. In 480 BC, the Persians had burnt Athens, and although the city was quickly reoccupied and patched up, it continued to look a mess for the next 30 years, until, that is, Pericles decided to rebuild the Acropolis, which became the seat of the gods, with a great new temple, the Parthenon. Inside, a giant statue was raised of the goddess Athena to bear witness to her power and the power of Athens itself. This was all done so quickly, within 11 years, that the technical tour de force impressed the Greeks as much as the grandeur of the result. The man who made this frieze was the Parthenon's artistic director, Phidias, considered one of the great sculptors of antiquity. We have some of his great works and we have the work of other sculptors done in the Phidias style. Most critics then as now admire the restraint, the nobility and the harmony that make them examples of the ideal and idealistic classical style. This is the work of another sculptor, Praxiteles, who worked 100 years after Phidias in mid-4th century BC. Praxiteles liberated the rather stiff classical shapes and warmed them up, which they needed, as you can see from this Aphrodite of Knidos. The Greeks had come a long way since the heroic age of Homer, not only in art and culture, but also in politics, a word, of course, derived from polis. By the end of the 6th century before Christ, most of the polis had cast off the rule of kings and princes and tried a variety of governments. There was tyranny, 
a kind of constitutional dictatorship not necessarily unpopular. There was aristocracy, the rule of the best or the best born, and oligarchy, the rule of the few, and democracy, the rule of the demos, the people, the crowd, or there was some combination of these as in the Athens of Pericles. In Athens, all citizens had equal rights, but as Pericles wrote in the 5th century before Christ, when a man is distinguished in any way, he is more highly honored in public life, not as a matter of privilege, but as a recognition of merit. On the other hand, anyone who can do the city good is not debarred by poverty or by the obscurity of his position. Pericles isn't meant to be taken literally, of course. Aristocracy wasn't really the rule of the best men, but rather of a few leaders drawn from old wealthy families. And democracy wasn't really the rule of all the people, but only a few thousand freeborn men. Still, a poor Athenian like Demosthenes could become a political leader in the 4th century BC and we can see in his success that even an ideal can define values and encourage aspirations which in turn can affect and change society. Because the way the Greeks chose leaders and the way they were ruled was apt to change, the Greeks also had a sense of history. It is no accident that the greatest historian of antiquity, Thucydides, was Greek. History is about men, women, institutions changing in time and space, and Thucydides saw change all around him in the 5th century BC. Unlike the Egyptians, who were so impressed by continuities and long chronologies, Unlike the Mesopotamians, who were so impressed by supernaturally induced catastrophes, Thucydides was more interested in the discernible motives of men's actions. He attributed decisions and actions and outcomes to objective factors like culture and economics, instead of supernatural intervention. Of course, most Greeks were not as objective. They were mostly peasants, small farm holders, craftsmen, artisans, often rooted in custom, superstition, and narrow localism. But the Persian invasions of the 6th century BC and the great national struggle against the Persian Empire in the 5th century brought the first inkling that perhaps it was better to die than to be a slave, that it might make sense to face death not just for your own home, but incredible as it sounds, for other people's homes, even for the homes of those wretched people in the next village that a common humanity or a common Hellenism might be more important than your own local customs and prejudices. There were also greater men who seemed even more important, the men that everybody was talking about. There was Themistocles, who commanded the Athenian fleet in the great victory over the Persians at Salamis in 480 BC, the victory that saved Greece. There was Aristides the Just, a contemporary of Themistocles, who administered the finances of Athens and the finances of its allies so honestly. 
There was Miltiades, the hero of Marathon, and Hecateus of Miletus, who made a picture of the earth, showing all the countries and the cities and the rivers. And Pythagoras, the wise teacher who discovered so much about numbers and about the wickedness of the world. What was it about these men that made them so different from the farmers who met in the Agora on market day? It was Sophia, wisdom. It was Arete, virtue. These famous men were not so much stronger or bigger or richer or better born, they were just wise and that is why they were better men. But if that were true, wasn't it possible for others to become wise like them? Couldn't even a peasant learn? There were a lot of Greeks who thought this might be possible and from that kind of thinking there evolved a way of looking at the world that helped to shape the future course of Western culture. And we shall see this in our next program. The Greek search for wisdom spared them neither from war nor from decline. But the philosophies they left us, their questioning of everything, even the gods themselves, made certain they would never be forgotten. Greek thought, this time on the Western tradition. Now last time, if you recall, we ended with the concept of Sophia, or wisdom, which was so important to the ancient Greeks. They had come to believe that the wisest man was the best man and that his wisdom could be taught even to the poorest, even to the humblest among them. Now, these days, of course, it's sometimes hard to understand why the Greeks made such a lot of fuss about things of this nature. In fact, our modern view of philosophy in general is that it is abstract and divorced from the real world. But the Greeks had to conquer their wisdom bit by bit. And they found it fascinating as they ascertained it precisely because it helped them make better sense of the world they lived in. So they did the hard work for us. And their thoughts about nature and reality and God have so profoundly influenced us that we now take them for granted. But in ancient Greece, it was all very new. As the 5th century before Christ ended, a group of philosophers called the Sophists appeared. The word Sophiste means either one who makes wise or possibly one who deals in wisdom. And so these itinerant teachers and lecturers crisscrossed the country making their living by trading in Sophia. Some of them were good teachers, some of them were not, and a lot of their wisdom came down to teaching quickness of wit in argument so their students could win a case in court or make points in a political debate. Many sophists were regarded as too clever by half and critical and subversive because they were prepared to follow an argument wherever it might lead them. When you go all out after truth, you cannot tell in advance that the truth will be what society would like it to be. The sophist Trasimachus, for instance, argued that rulers and governments make laws to their own advantage and that there's no justice except in the interests of the stronger. Another sophist, Callicles, argued that institutions and moral precepts were established not by gods, but by men like these as a matter of convenience. At least this is what Plato says Callicles and other sophists taught. 
Plato was an Athenian born around 427 BC. Among other things, he founded a school of philosophy called the Academy, which evolved into the first real university. This is a Roman mosaic of one of his classes. But Plato is best known for writing a number of dialogues in which philosophical questions were discussed. Because he was a conservative spirit, Plato sometimes made the sophists out to be more subversive than they were, was particularly disturbed by their argument that man is the measure of all things and that man has no way of knowing whether the gods really exist. But conservative as Plato was, he too was going to subvert old ideas simply by teaching that men had to use their own brains and come to conclusions based on observation and reasoning. This, after all, was what his teacher Socrates had taught him. Socrates, whom Plato loved, was probably the most notorious of the sophists, even though he himself didn't want to be considered one and never accepted pay for his teaching as the sophists did. Socrates' favorite pastime was to argue with fellow Athenians and sting them out of their conventions and accepted ideas. Socrates questioned everything ordinary people took for granted or preferred to leave unquestioned. Above all, he questioned some of the gods that his countrymen believed in. Greek art is filled with images of gods who kidnap and lie and steal and cheat and murder unjustly and who commit adultery. If these things were bad in a man, how could they be good in a god? And so Socrates said, better listen to your conscience, listen to the inner voice that tells you what is truly right. And if you don't know, keep asking questions of yourself and others until you find out. Now, this kind of free-thinking approach was particularly disturbing to Athenians at the time because of what was happening to their city. Athens was at war, and the war was going badly. By the middle of the 5th century BC, Athens had become an empire with its member states circling the Aegean Sea, and this expansion led her into a series of wars, culminating in the Great Peloponnesian War, the war between Athens and the states of the Peloponnesus to the south of it. In 431 BC, Athens was attacked by Sparta, her neighbor, and achieved a standoff. But instead of stopping there, she pursued an aggressive war of expansion in Sicily that led to a catastrophic defeat in 413 BC in which she lost some 200 ships, 4,500 of her own men, and 10 times as many of her subjects and allies. And yet the fighting continued for another decade. Here's how the historian Thucydides, who actually fought in the war, described it. The Peloponnesian War was a protracted struggle and attended by calamities such as Hellas had never known within a like period of time. Never were so many cities captured and depopulated, some by barbarians, others by Hellenes themselves fighting against one another, and several of them after their capture were repeopled by strangers. Never were exile and slaughter more frequent, whether in the war or brought about by civil strife. This endless and bloody war triggered rebellions throughout the Athenian Empire until Athens was finally defeated in 404 BC. In that year, Athens was forced to surrender unconditionally to Sparta and its city walls were demolished as a symbol of total defeat. 
Yet here, in the midst of utter disaster, the Athenians were being told by this poisonous old man Socrates to question everything at a time when most people wanted only to lick their wounds, not pour salt in them. And so after being barely tolerated for decades as an eccentric nuisance, Socrates was put on trial in 399 BC on specific charges of impiety and for corrupting the young, but actually for asking too many unpleasant questions in the time of crisis. This is an 18th century version of how it all ended. Convicted by a very close vote because he wanted to be, Socrates was offered exile but preferred a sentence of death by poison as a martyr to free inquiry. 300 years after Socrates' death, Cicero, the Roman philosopher and statesman, Cicero said that Socrates had brought philosophy down from the heavens. But by wresting it away from the gods and bringing it down to earth, Socrates also helped precipitate a crisis in Greek religion. You might broadly define the crisis as a questioning of civic religion. Each polis had its civic gods and its civic laws, and worshipping the ones and obeying the others was part of being a citizen, part of being a member of the political community. But neither the gods nor the laws had much to say about morality, about real justice, let alone about the soul or what happened to the soul after death. And those were precisely the issues that Socrates and the other sophists were most concerned about. Is your first duty to civil law or to your conscience? If public and private duty clash, what are you supposed to do? Which is more important, the individual or the state? None of these questions has an obvious answer. The novelty was that they were being asked at all. And once you start asking questions, it's very hard to stop. You might even end by questioning the gods themselves. For instance, the sophists argue that if these traditional gods, like Athena, are inextricably linked to the city and their worship is linked to the laws of the city, then the gods must vary from city to city because different cities have different laws. Which means that gods like Poseidon here have only relative importance and no absolute validity, and what kind of god is a relative god? As the philosopher Xenophanes said, mortals suppose that the gods are born and that they have voices and bodies and clothes like humans, but if oxen or horses or lions had hands and could draw with their hands and paint pictures as men do, they would portray their gods as having bodies like their own. Horses would portray them as horses, oxen like oxen. Ethiopians have gods with snub noses and black hair. Thracians have gods with grey eyes and red hair. Furthermore, you only had to look around in the streets to see that bad men prospered and good men sometimes suffered unjustly, so that either everything is a matter of luck and there are no gods, or else the gods are stupid, nasty and unjust, with a very twisted sense of humor. Every Greek knew that the gods particularly enjoyed imposing tests on innocent sufferers like Oedipus here, who after being abandoned at birth was set up by the gods to kill his father and then marry his mother. How can you respect unjust gods? All you can do is bribe them or appease them with sacrifices or prayers, but even that doesn't seem to work very well. 
As a young man in one of Plato's dialogues concludes, either there are no gods, or if there are, they take no care of men. Another set of difficult questions had to do with the order of the world. Greek philosophers of nature called physicists had been trying to answer the riddle of creation since the 6th century BC. Fish, said the philosopher Anaximander, are the ancestors of human beings who originated in water and evolved through several stages. Xenophanes, who died in 475 BC, noticed fossils and pretty much understood what they were. And there were other attempts to develop a scientific approach to knowledge. Hippocrates, who founded a medical school, applied the new approach to what was called then the sacred disease, the common term for epilepsy. I do not believe that the sacred disease is any more divine or sacred than any other disease, but on the contrary, has specific characteristics and a definite cause. It's my opinion that those who first called this disease sacred were the sort of people we call witch doctors, faith healers, quacks or charlatans. If the patient be cured, their reputation for cleverness is enhanced. If he dies, they can excuse themselves by explaining that the gods are to blame. At the same time, mathematicians like Thales borrowed geometry, arithmetic and astronomy from the Babylonians and Egyptians and improved on them. They found that the application of geometrical rules could help to locate ships at sea and stars in the heavens and help to divide sundials more accurately. Thales himself predicted the eclipse of 585 BC. He accompanied King Croesus of Lydia as his military engineer and advisor and he diverted a river. Other 6th century engineers at Samos used geometry to plan a tunnel one-third of a mile long which conveyed water through a mountain. But even if the applications of the new sciences could be very practical, the discoveries had been made in pursuit of higher ends. The Greek philosophers thought that the universal truths of mathematics could reveal an immutable, eternal reality behind the passing drama of everyday life. They believed that geometry could provide a model of timeless nature, just as a pyramid was supposed to do. Plato suggested that the truths of geometry were not reason deductions from experiment, from figures that people drew or constructed, but that they were ideal memories. Memories of the properties of ideal geometrical shapes that existed in some timeless realm which reason could barely apprehend. And Plato argued further that there was an eternal world of ideas, prototypes of the debased reflections of things that we glimpse here on Earth. This theory, that we do not experience reality in the so-called real world, but only its dim shadow, this theory has haunted philosophy ever since. At the same time, the physicists were also asking what was behind life. Did everything start with fire, or with water, or with some other material element? Thales thought it started with water, which by successive evolutions became the other elements.
Anaximander, on the other hand, thought it started with a spiritual force, nous, or the mind, whose action on matter produced both movement and order. From this idea, there grew a tradition which regarded this first principle, or if you like, this prime mover of life, which regarded these as divine, in fact as God. A cosmic God, who wasn't just responsible for the creation of things and their order on earth and in the skies, but who stood for the ultimate truth, justice, beauty, goodness, harmony that you could not find on earth and that you could not find either among the traditional gods on Olympus. This sort of transcendent god was rather abstract and hard to imagine and so Plato tried to produce a more accessible version. He began with the view that ideal reality is perfect because it is immutable and changing. The objects that we see all around us, on the other hand, are inferior because they change all the time. A perfect object would not need to change precisely because it was perfect. There was one kind of visible object, however, that was not inferior, and that was the heavenly bodies. They change, but they always change in the same way their movement is always constant. To Plato, such regularity, such constancy, were very special, and they couldn't have happened simply by accident. They presupposed a moving soul endowed with mind. Therefore, Plato reasoned, there must be a divine mind that moves the heavens. And this mind is God. At the same time, the traditional city gods like Athena and the civic religion were declining. That's because as the polis themselves were declining during and after the Peloponnesian War, they were losing their autonomy, becoming part of bigger states which told them what to do. And as the polis civic religions lost their hold at least over the elite, the platonic religion of a cosmic god kept increasing in influence. Plato, in his dialogue Timaeus, suggested that the human soul was akin to the soul of the star. We come from the stars, he argued, and after death we return to them, to the celestial city of the stars. It was a very attractive idea and one which also had worldly implications. Because if there be such a place as the celestial city, and it would have to be a city because where else would civilized people live, then why should we not conceive its counterpart on earth? Less perfect naturally, but still something for the wise, educated man to strive for. And this became the prototype for what we now call the ivory tower. Whereas once a socially active life was the ideal, now the ideal becomes escape to the contemplative life. As the 4th century BC ends, Aristotle, as depicted in this Roman fresco, follows Plato in pointing to the value of the theoretical and celebrating the life of study that the philosopher and the scholar enjoy, the meditation on eternal things. By the time of Aristotle, who died in 322 BC, Philip of Macedon and his son Alexander had totally ended the autonomy of the Greek polis. 
the earthly city no longer offer the kind of noble aim which a wise man might live for. And so the sage took refuge in the heavenly city. This is where he would find consolation and strength to bring the movements of the soul into harmony with the movements of the heavens. And so, the disillusioned citizens of Athens tried to make their escape towards the city of the sky. This religion of cosmic forces and the cosmic god was going to become part of the Greek paideia, the intellectual equipment that everyone who aspired to be educated had to have in the Hellenistic world of the 3rd century BC and after. So long after the 3rd century BC in effect, that it is still with us today. In our next program, we shall take a closer look at what happened when Greece was conquered by Alexander the Great, one of the most brilliant generals of all time, and a megalomaniac of genius. Until then. He sought greatness in everything he did. He conquered the known world in a few years, and was thought to be more God than man. And when he died, he left behind warring empires, a common basis of Greek culture, and a memory that has fascinated men ever since. Alexander the Great, this time on the Western tradition. In the year 401 BC, a Persian prince raised a force, a very large force of about 12,000 Greek mercenaries to fight his older brother, the king, for the Persian throne. Now the prince was killed in the first major battle and even though his Greek mercenaries defeated the huge Persian army, the Greeks found themselves in the middle of Persia, very close to Babylon, without any friends and without any leaders. They had to march a thousand miles to the Black Sea coast and then 500 more miles along the coast to Byzantium across horrible terrain and fighting all the way. But they made it. And this epic long march persuaded both Greeks and non-Greeks that the mercenaries' hoplite phalanx, this wedge formation of heavily armed infantry, that the phalanx was invincible. And they reasoned further that if only the Greek infantry had good cavalry support, no power on earth could withstand them a prediction that turned out to be as accurate as it seemed sweeping. The story of these mercenaries, who were known as the Ten Thousand, was told by one of them, an Athenian soldier named Xenophon. And by the time Xenophon died, around 355 BC, a new power was rising in the ancient world that would bear out the inspiration of the Ten Thousands' famous march, the power of Macedon. The Macedonians were really Greeks, but the Greeks didn't consider them to be so any more than 16th century Scots were considered English. These are Macedonian ruins. Back in the 5th century before Christ, Macedonia was still a wild country with a feudal system of rural tribes and clans. A hereditary king had religious and military power over all this and over his people, at least in theory. This is what remains of the royal palace. Although the Macedonian royal house and nobles were attracted by Greek culture and uh, quite Hellenized, the land remained a backwater until mid-4th century BC, when a Macedonian king named Philip tamed 
the local warlords. He did it by subjecting all free men to conscription and by making them serve in regular royal troops under his own officers. Philip copied the military methods of these Greek soldiers but improved on them, combining the phalanx with light infantry and more importantly with a heavy cavalry that the 10,000 never had. The Macedonians could mount a formidable cavalry force because their country had great plains and broad estates where the nobles especially rode from their early youth. As the world had surmised 50 years before, no power on earth was able to stop them. Philip set out with his army to dominate or conquer most of the Greek cities and he succeeded brilliantly, not only because he had a superior fighting force, highly integrated, very loyal to him, but also because the Greek polis were divided, even more divided than usual. The Persians had been working hard to keep them that way so that they would continue to fight each other instead of the Persian Empire. Philip was able to beat the Greek polis handily, but the only thing that could then unite them under his rule was an appeal to them, not as Athenians or as Corinthians, but as Hellenes. As Philip knew well, to be a Greek in those days was to be a free citizen, as contrasted to a barbarian subject of a despot, as the Persians were. It was to cherish the pride of Salamis and Plataea, great victories over the Persians. Most important, it was to aspire to a fuller vengeance on the invader of the past, the Persians again, who still ruled the Greek cities of the Near East. There was also the lost wealth of those eastern cities to regain, and there were the precedents of myth and legend in which heroes like Heracles had done great deeds in the East. In fact, when Philip's son, Alexander the Great, crossed into Asia in 334 BC, he took a side trip to the site of ancient Troy to convince his public that a new Achilles, Alexander himself, was arming for the traditional feud between Greek and Asian. And so, from the beginning of the 4th century BC, we find the idea growing among the Greeks of a war of reprisal against the Persians. A war of conquest in Asia that would diffuse internal conflict by turning Greek violence and energy outward from the homeland. Such a war could also open new areas for commercial expansion and for colonization. As it were, the Greeks were checked in the West by the power of Carthage and they were encountering local resistance to their colonies in Italy. In fact, the Greek colonial world hadn't grown since the 7th and the 6th centuries BC, but it needed to grow because constant warfare so hurt the economy and especially the agriculture that it couldn't support even a stagnant population. So Greece sent out some of its excess people, artisans like this blacksmith, the young and adventurers, artists and scholars, and engineers and traders, but it founded no new cities and it found no real solution to its problems of overpopulation except for war. All these arguments for a war against the Persians were invoked by the Macedonians, but they didn't always work because many Greeks liked the Macedonians even less than they liked the Persians who were further away and not as familiar. Still, as long as Philip and his son Alexander proclaimed themselves champions of Hellenism, 
even if they couldn't talk some cities into supporting them, at least they could shame them into staying neutral. The Macedonians also worked hard to intimidate the Greek mercenaries who were in the habit of selling themselves to the highest bidder, which was dangerous because the great king of Persia could bid a lot higher than Philip and Alexander could. But the mercenaries quickly got the message when they were declared traitors to the national cause, to the Hellenic cause, and massacred or sent off to work in the mines as slaves, which was a lot worse than being killed. And so a national war to conquer the Persian Empire in Asia became the grand design. Although King Philip was assassinated in 336 BC before he could carry it out, his son Alexander proved equal to the task. Alexander, who was 20 when he succeeded his father, was a pupil of Aristotle. He had read Xenophon, and he knew what could be done and what could be won in Asia. So in 334 BC, he led the Greek and Macedonian forces across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. He then overthrew the Persian Empire. He conquered all the lands from Libya to Afghanistan. He created a Greco-Macedonian empire that would spread Greeks and Hellenism all over the East, and he did all this in only 11 years, after which he died of a fever in Babylon, aged 32 or 33. Alexander was truly one of the greatest generals of all time and a megalomaniac of genius. Time has softened his more brutal aspects, but it's worth remembering that the ruthless Macedonian general Cassander, who knew Alexander as a young man, could never pass his statue without shuddering. Because Alexander's conquest seemed impossible, everybody except those who knew him thought he was more than a hero. He was a god. Soon, Alexander decided that he should be treated as a god, which was also rather convenient because it fitted in with oriental traditions where the divinity of a king was the basis of his authority. One of Alexander's bequests to history would be the memory of his megalomaniac ambition and the leader cult that grew up around him. It would later inspire ambitious and ruthless men who wanted to equal his achievements. Men like Julius Caesar and Napoleon. Another aspect of this extraordinary man was the way he appears to behave as a philosopher king of the kind that Plato described and that Aristotle may have trained him to be. Alexander made sure that philosophers and scientists would be part of his expeditions to observe and record everything they could, and he sought greatness in everything he did. When he burnt down the Persian royal palace at Persepolis in retaliation for the Persians burning of Athens a century and a half before, he followed it up with a mass marriage between Persian maidens and Greek nobles, a symbol of the fusion he hoped to accomplish of Greeks and other peoples in order to create one great everlasting empire. But reality couldn't be bent to obey Alexander's dream. The worlds his conquests brought together were too different, and when he died, they split apart. These new empires and the culture they represented were neither Greek nor Asian, but rather a bit of both, which is why they are described not as Hellenic, not purely Greek, but as Hellenistic. 
The subsequent period, called the Hellenistic Age, spanned the three eventful centuries between the death of Alexander in 323 BC and the death in 30 before Christ of Cleopatra, who was descended from one of Alexander's generals. It was an age that looks remarkably like our own time. We find the same reversion from representative institutions to authoritarian regimes, the same sense of psychological and aesthetic fragmentation, the same anti-rationalist trends, the same self-absorbed interest in the self, the same obsessive pursuit of affluence, exotic cults, peculiar fads, astrology, magic, eroticism, the same preoccupation with bigness, the same detachment from the hometown, with a concomitant but not very comforting feeling that the whole cosmos is your polis, the same social conflicts and class wars and colonialism and wars of national liberation designed to expel foreign oppressors and to allow the locals to oppress each other. The same bureaucracy more interested in making and keeping rules rather than in making things more productive or more efficient. The same retreat from political involvement. The same cringing sense of depersonalization in the big city, in megalopolis, a place of which name actually exists in Greece, in Arcadia. So let's take a closer look at this strangely familiar period. The states that Alexander's generals founded in the Hellenistic age, like that of Ptolemy in Egypt or Seleucus in Babylon, these states were traditional monarchies highly regulated and bureaucratic, but the cities and the royal courts and the armies and the higher officials were mostly Greek with cosmopolitan Greek values. Although the Greeks and Macedonians intermarried with the local people and a lot of the locals were Hellenized, none of this integration went very deep. The difference was too great between the people in the relatively sophisticated, relatively free, literate, Greek-speaking urban centers and the people in the unfree countryside, those immense regions where the king exercised direct authority as absolute master over his servile subjects. Greeks were reluctant to accept the authority of monarchs who demanded adoration in the oriental fashion, and they didn't believe in their divinity or infallibility either. Instead, the Greeks continued to maintain that law and institutions were products of reason, not of some divine revelation. So there was no true cultural synthesis in the Hellenistic age. As you can see from this Roman fresco of Syria on the right contemplating Macedonia, the two cultures remained mostly suspicious and contemptuous of one another, even though they lived side by side. One way of looking at the Greek and Macedonian colonies during this period is to compare them with the settlements of the British in India in the 19th and 20th centuries. In both cases, an expatriate ruling class in an ocean of foreigners keeps the flag flying in their clubs and cantonments with their peculiar social rituals which are designed to mark not synthesis but distinction and superiority.
this kind of separatism could provide no basis for real integration, nor was any kind of integration desired. But it did offer impressive models for the surrounding populations. Just as British laws and administrative practices and the English language and even cricket have been taken over and adapted in India and throughout the rest of the empire, which the British hold no more. Unintegrated as these Greek and Macedonian cities were in the Hellenistic age, they were going to be vehicles of Hellenization, spreading Greek culture, institutions, ideas, styles, and language as far away from Greece as Afghanistan and India. Let me give you an example. These are the ruins of a Greek city on the northern border of Afghanistan at Ai Kanum. We know that the men who founded the city probably came from Thessaly in central Greece. And from the inscription on the pillar we know also that another Greek, probably a philosopher, made an extraordinary journey here presumably because he knew he would find communities interested in hearing him lecture. In this particular city, which was only excavated about 20 years ago, there was a gymnasium, that very Greek institution of culture and training where youths met for exercise and discussion, and there was a large administration area which contained a library. This papyrus document was found in the library ruins and it's written in Greek. And here is the temple inside the city walls and the residential area with mosaic floors. and all sorts of things that typify a Greek city. And these Greek institutions and Greek traditions continued strong here at the end of the world until the city was destroyed by nomads from the steppes in the late second century. So this is how the Greeks exported their urban culture throughout the Hellenistic world, a world which grew to be larger and more closely linked than anything before it. When Alexander's wars of conquest were over, he had quadrupled the size of the Greeks' known world, and that gave a great impetus to travel and trade. Most of the overland trade went by caravan over tracks beaten hard by the hooves of pack animals. But the Persian kings had also built an impressive post road which ran 1500 miles from Sardis on the coast to their capital at Susa. It was lined with stables, with hostelries, with forts. During the Hellenistic age, roads and tracks were used mostly by soldiers and officials, but they also improved the movement of goods when these couldn't be shipped by water, which was, of course, much easier. And this trade was going to grow tremendously because the wealth of rulers and of cities increasingly depended on exchange with other regions. In fact, Hellenistic rulers were really merchant princes. There were trade expeditions to Africa and Arabia and India for elephants and incense and spices and slaves. The size of merchant ships kept growing as well. Syracuse in Sicily even launched a ship with a capacity of 4,500 tons. And the circulation of money grew too. This is a silver coin from Phoenicia. And here is one from Syracuse. 
At the same time, a Greek dialect called the Koine was providing a common language from Gibraltar to the Caspian Sea, which greatly facilitated trade and the spread of Hellenistic culture as well. A Greek intellectual like this physician could feel equally at home in Alexandria, which was in Egypt, or in Syracuse in Sicily. Actors had international associations with chapters in every important city, like the Guild of Dionysiac Artists. And athletes joined such groups as the International Boxing Association. And if you wanted to worship goddesses like Isis here, you could find their temples wherever you went. And so, in the 200 years before the birth of Christ, ideas, fashions, and goods were spreading remarkably fast. Ironically, it was the decay of the classical Greek polis so admired for centuries, it was its decay that gave birth to this new era. It brought about an openness to the outside world and the beginning of a certain cosmopolitan, even human solidarity. And this decay of the polis, which also undermined the classical disciplines with their order, with a certain rigor, or at least a certain impersonality. This decay of civic bonds and disciplines permitted, encouraged, a new spirit of eclecticism that is highly characteristic of the Hellenistic age. It was a time rather like ours of large impersonal states and individuals who felt lost in them, a time of consumption, brutality, sophistication, experimentation, and trying to find justification and consolation in religious cults. The Hellenistic age, this time on the Western tradition. Last time uh, we ended with the waning of the independent Greek cities, the polis and the decay of their classical disciplines in the three centuries before Christ. But this was not, as you might expect, an era of decline. On the contrary, once the grip of the polis was weakened, a new spirit of openness arose in the Hellenistic age, a spirit of experimentation and diversity. The most striking example of this was in art. The artists of the classical period imposed standards that were outside and beyond the change and decay that are part of human life. But the artists of the Hellenistic age tried to embrace those very qualities of humanity that go with change and with a variety of life. Classical perfection was pure, austere, unchanging. The artists of classical and pre-classical Greece had aimed at forms that could be regarded as timeless and ideal, calm, fixed in their perfection. But then everything loosened up. The statues of the Hellenistic age move like human beings. They express human emotions. They strive for greater realism, for movement, for sensuality. This is the art of a society that's sufficiently pleased with itself not to want to imitate gods and heroes. Fortune is no longer enthroned in stiff majesty. She sits like a normal woman. Aphrodite flows and curves in a sinuous movement. Victory alights on the prow of a ship and you can feel the wind pressing the folds of her dress against her body. 
And then all this technical virtuosity becomes exaggerated in statues like this one of Laocon and his sons entangled in what appears to be a giant strand of pasta, but which is actually a snake that goddess Athena sent to kill them. In this respect, the Hellenistic Greeks were rather like ourselves, admiring moderation, but often going to extremes. But if much of this art with its Baroque convolutions and grotesque sugary pathos is less admired than its classical predecessors, it's also more natural, more dramatic, more dynamic. And it is also more inclined to historical references. This is the first age of museums, collections, libraries, private and public, and of archaeology. So what some denounced at the time as fragmentation and alienation in a vast impersonal state, others appreciate as greater independence in a more open, less constricting society. Polis-directed art goes out, individual-directed art comes in. We get portraits in busts and paintings that are not idealized but lifelike. We get landscapes and still lives which would have been completely irrelevant when only gods and the polis mattered. And now the center of literary life is not Athens as it had been for so long, but the new Hellenistic city of Alexandria, which produces psychological speculation and biography and autobiography. In this theatrical scene, lovers struggle not against gods, but against parents and rivals, and the references are not to higher values, but to wills and dowries and stolen letters, as in modern entertainment. And the public also wants happy endings, not just the inevitably grim misadventures of classical Greek tragedy. There is a wider market for art now, and there is a greater variety in public taste. It's less grand, less noble than that of the 5th or 6th century BC. It mirrors a more vulgar society, insecure, uneasy, excited, but livelier, much like our own. Another familiar aspect of the Hellenistic world is that one's social experience in the community had shifted from an accessible human scale where you could affect your environment if you wanted to, to a fragmented, depersonalized society. If you wanted to lead a good life, you could no longer say, as Plato said, let's make a good society, good society make good men, good men lead good lives. And if you wanted to play a part in the world, you could no longer just stay in your polis because the polis mattered less and less. You had to enter the service of one of the great kings who ruled in Macedonia or Egypt or Syria. These kings now ruled so many different peoples that they were practically forced to take over the oriental tradition of a godlike king because that alone could bind so many different territories and tribes and cities uh, to their rule. Even the lesser kings had pretensions based on Alexander's claims to divinity. But such pretensions were completely contrary to Greek values. So something had to give. And if it wasn't going to be the kings, it was going to have to be the Greeks. In the fourth century BC, when Alexander wrote back to Greece asking to be worshipped as a god, the Spartans, for one, took it calmly with a mixture of practicality and skepticism. If he wants to be a god, they said, let him be god. 
You can see where this led by looking at Antiochus I of Commagene, a Hellenistic king of the first century BC. When he built his tomb at Nemrut Dag, which is now in Turkey, Antiochus cut off the top of a mountain 8,200 feet high and had it replaced with a tumulus, a grave mound 400 feet high, with colossal statues of Greek and Persian gods in whose midst he sits enthroned, a god among the gods. Hubris on this scale was a radical break with the Greek tradition of moderation. It also offended Greek ideas of the dignity of free men, subject only to the laws of the polis. But the days of the autonomous polis were long gone. Now the power rested with the kings. So the problem arose. How was a free-thinking man supposed to adapt himself to the new situation? What should he do if he wanted to live as a good man, an honest man, stand by his principles? Should he remain aloof? Should he act? And if he was going to act, by what rules should he act? Now, this is the problem of the various Hellenistic schools of philosophy, the, problems, the problem they had to face. And while they answered it differently, they all agreed that man must find the source of freedom and justice within himself. Freedom in classical times consisted of obeying the law of your city and its gods. But in the Hellenistic age, it would have to consist of an internal freedom that comes from being at one with the cosmic order and with oneself. The wise man is free even if he is a slave as long as he can establish and retain his eternal freedom. If he is his own master, then he has no master. No human can intimidate him. Passions, fears, greed, desires cannot shake his equanimity. He doesn't feel the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Indeed, he learns not to worry about chance or fate or fortune at all because he is more autonomous than any polis could be. The cynics, whose best-known representative was the philosopher Diogenes, had one of the many recipes for achieving such autonomy and detachment. Essentially, the cynics believed in being poor, rude and unconventional, dropping out of society, avoiding family or any kind of property and begging to stay alive. Diogenes himself lived in a barrel or whatever other shelter he could find in the Athens streets. This is a 16th century depiction of a famous story about him in which Alexander comes to ask if there's anything he can do for the old man, at which point Diogenes asks him to get out of his light. This is one way to avoid fate, give up everything and be rude to others. Another way is to avoid the others and the world except for a few kindred souls and the basic essentials you need to lead a civilized life. Avoid pain, avoid worry and the anxieties that come with worldly interests. Seek only pleasure. The word hedonism is derived from the Greek word for pleasure, but these were not vulgar pleasures of the body, but rather the satisfaction derived from having your mind at rest. This was the doctrine of the philosopher Epicurus, who lived from 341 to 270 BC. Since his doctrine recommended dropping out of the world, it never had much political or historical influence. 
Epicurus's more successful rival was Zeno, who lived from 335 to 263 BC. It's significant that where Epicurus taught his philosophy in a private garden, Zeno taught his in a public arcade, a stoa like this one. And Stoicism, the name of Zeno's philosophy, is much more about public concerns than Epicureanism is because it teaches that internal freedom comes from being in tune with the order of the universe. Perceive the cosmic order, says Zeno. Grasp the ruling will of the universe, then submit to it, and you are free. That, at least, was the Stoics' view of spiritual autonomy. But they also believed that you couldn't just ignore the world outside because it was a reflection, however pale, of the cosmic order. And the wise man, they taught, can see the relationship between the two. It's the wise man's duty to restore and improve order in the world around him, to bring the everyday world in line with the cosmos, to counsel the despots who have power to act, and so turn kings into philosophers. So, where the cynics were anarchists and the Epicureans were passive contemplators, the Stoics were conservative political activists who, rather as the Puritans were going to do, cheerlessly took on the burdens of the world. Yet, however reluctant the Stoic appears, his philosophy is positive because he teaches that a higher order governs the world and that it's the duty of good men to uphold the nobler values which are their own reward. A third century biographer of Greek philosophers, Diogenes Laertius, listed the principles of Stoic philosophy. He wrote, the end may be defined as life in accordance with nature, or in other words, in accordance with our own human nature as well as that of the universe. A life in which we refrain from every action forbidden by the law common to all things, that is to say, the right reason which pervades all things. Now this stoic belief in a moral law of nature comprehending all people was then translated into Roman legal terms and it became the sanction behind large-scale government and it was passed on to the Middle Ages and beyond. And stoic beliefs also made a major contribution to Christianity. As you can see from the works of Epictetus, a Greek philosopher who lived from 60 to 120 AD. This is what he wrote. You, O oh man, are God's principal work. You are a distinct portion of the essence of God and contain a certain part of him in yourself. Why then are you ignorant of your noble birth? It is within yourself that you carry him, and you do not observe that you profane him by impure thoughts and unclean actions. In the meantime, however, there is another darker aspect of the Hellenistic period, the persistence and popularity of primitive mystery religions. These women are participants in Dionysiac cult rites. Only the initiated learn the secrets to the mysteries of life, and so only they are afforded salvation. Whether these mystery cults worshipped Isis or Serapis from Egypt, Mithras from Persia or others, they all had this in common, they were the business of the individual, not the polis. 
They took no account of political responsibilities and they bound people together in communities of worshippers quite independent of the state religion. The simplest of these were the good old earth religions like the Eleusinian cult you see depicted here or the Dionysiac cults. This is Dionysius himself, the god of fertility, wine and drama. In all of the cults a young king appears who is the bearer of spring and a new summer. He appears as the savior of the earth which winter had made cold and lifeless and which all the pollutions of the past had doomed to barrenness. And by an extrapolation, the young king is also the savior and purifier of mankind from all kind of evils, bringing a new age to the world. Then there is the lady, the old earth or fertility goddess, the mother or sister or wife of the savior, who is often both a virgin and a mother, and who appears all around the Mediterranean in a variety of shapes and names. Lastly, there are the heavenly bodies, the sun seen here in his chariot, the moon, the stars represented by these boys who dive out of sight when the dawn comes. Over the centuries, this worship came gradually into contact with a more definite sun worship of Persia and eventually it brought us the cult of Mithras, the unconquered sun who is seen here slaughtering a bull to guarantee the return of the seasons. Mithras became particularly popular in Rome in the second century and proved to be the chief rival of Christianity. After the sun there were the planets in their seven spheres surrounding the earth. Their movement reflected the will of providence. Their power affected everything even the days of the week. Next to these heavenly bodies, life and human endeavor are a vain thing. So the religion of later antiquity becomes absorbed in plans of escape from the prison of earth, her sister planets, and the other lesser stars. Men and women are the sport of fate and chance, to say nothing of the native ills and demons of the earth. But if you could move away past the sphere of the earth, past the sphere of the moon and of the other rulers of the universe. Then you could get to the sphere of the ultimate God, whatever his name may be, where there is true being and freedom. And more than freedom, the ultimate union with God. The kind of knowledge which would enable you to get to this point must be taught. Men must be initiated as in this ceremony in a temple of Isis. So here you have priests and prophets and teachers. But above all, you have the figure of a redeemer, a godly savior, who is connected with figures like Attis or Adonis in Asia Minor, Osiris in Egypt, Dionysius in Greece, and the special Jewish idea of the Messiah who would save the chosen people. This Redeemer has various names, particularly that of Christos, of anointed. And above all, he is in a very profound sense man, or the son of man, even though he is also a god. The logic goes this way, since the ultimate unseen god, spirit though he is, made man in his own image, it follows that god is himself man. He is the real, the ultimate, perfect, eternal man of whom all bodily people are just feeble copies. So this god and ideal or first man is the father. 
while the Redeemer, the Savior, is his Son, the image of the Father or the Son of Man. Usually this Savior comes down from heaven to save mankind. And then when his work is done, he goes back to heaven to sit by the side of the Father in glory. And thereafter, the chosen people he has saved will be able to join him. Of course, you can see the similarities with later Christian doctrine. But you must notice too that these early mystery cults, including the mysteries of the Gnostics who influenced some early Christians and against whom other Christians reacted, that all these mystery cults were exclusive just as the Hebrew religion was exclusive. They were a set of cliques of chosen people, each with their particular contract or password to salvation. Whereas, as we shall see in due course, the Christians were going to realize the universal implications of these cults in a much more effective way. For the moment, I would just point out this. It's impossible not to see these religious developments as emotional aids for men and women who without them felt that they faced the world alone and who found their native powers were simply not up to the ordeal. But out of this process there grew a new kind of self-consciousness, a sense of personal privacy and internality such as the Greek of the classical age never possessed. Men and women were slowly making souls for themselves, and they were making churches too, whose values and rights and institutions stood for the first time outside the political community for better or for worse. Next time I shall talk about the rise of Rome. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.